And um, how nice to be here and how lovely to be connected to Michael all those many miles away. I haven't seen you for so long, Michael, so this is great. And I hope you're well and Berkeley is full of sunshine. So Yes, uh, it is. I uh, it's very good to see you, Rosie, and to be included, uh, thanks to Daisy also, and to be in a lineup of some of the writers I most ad admire. So it's wonderful to be here. Great. So I want to, in our short allotted time, touch on caffeine as well, but I guess it would be great to start. Um, you wrote last week an extraordinary piece in the New York Times, um, the impact- New York on, Review of Books. All right, New York Review of Books. Yeah. On COVID-19 and what its impact has been on the American food system. Um, can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, um, you know, the, the food system here in America is, is buckling. Um, we've had a lot of problems, uh, and these are and the problems are the kind that actually lay bare uh, deep-seated issues with uh, how unsustainable our food system is and how brittle it is. Uh, we've had shortages on the shelves. There are certain products that have disappeared. Some of it at the beginning was a, a, a crisis of hoarding, a demand issue, because people just were rushing to, you know, fill their pantries when they heard they were going to be locked down. But as time went on, the problems expanded and became uh, supply problems. And our TV screens were full of images of uh, farmers euthanizing animals, um, millions of chickens and pigs, uh, and um, throwing out milk into, into the, onto the soil and uh, burying whole crops. At the same time, there were shortages and people lining up for hours uh, to get food at food banks. So how could these two images coexist? Well, it pointed to uh, a food chain that has gotten so specialized and so concentrated um, because we have very weak antitrust enforcement that the kinds of farmers who are supplying institutions like schools, um, uh, corporate offices, um, they're very different than the farmers who are supplying grocery stores and farmers markets. And that first food chain, we really have two food chains, and that first food chain uh, fell apart as soon as people started staying home. But there was no way to easily move that food, reroute it from the, this, this institutional food chain to the retail food chain, which was just a mark of how specialized we've gotten. Um, you know, there's basically one company dominates, say, uh, liquid eggs, uh, which are used, of course, only in, no one uses them at home, but they're used to make omelets and, and scrambled eggs in schools and, and cafeterias of various kinds. And Cargill kind of controls that market. And the people selling their eggs to Cargill by the millions don't have the packing equipment, don't have the contacts and the contracts to move into supermarkets. So supermarkets were running out of eggs. At the same time, we also had a crisis in meat production. Um, meat plants in America uh, have uh, become really the, one of the most serious hotspots for infection. And it's no wonder because you cannot socially distance in a modern meat plant. Unlike in Europe, um, there are, uh, our meat plants are not only highly mechanized, but the, the, the line speeds are so fast. Uh, we're, they're allowed to slaughter up to 175 chickens per minute. Imagine these birds flying by you and you're busy trying to cut them. Um, and uh, you, you know, as, the, as the workers have told journalists, you can't even stop to cover a cough, um, much less go to the bathroom. And, and chicken plant workers uh, routinely wear diapers for that reason. So it's an insane environment. It's Yes, it's efficient. But when you have a, a, a crisis like COVID-19, it's, it's, a, it's a disaster. So staying with these intensively farmed, um, the meat packing and the chicken farms, when COVID struck, were they not just closed down and people sent home. What, what, what happened? Do you say they became a hotspot? Yeah, well, um, initially they were closed. They were, uh, as these tests were done and people were started reporting, you know, not showing up to work because they were sick. I mean, we're talking about by the thousands. Um, the local public health authorities, along with the local governors, closed them down in many cases. 
Uh, the industry, however, objected to this. Uh, and John Tyson, who's the, I think, the chair of the second biggest meat company in America, uh, he took out ads in the newspaper uh, warning, uh, and I think these were directed at the president and no one else, warning that uh, the, the, the meat, there might be meat shortages, that the food chain was breaking, he said. And within two days of that ad, President Trump invoked uh, something called the Defense Production Act, which is a Korean War era uh, law that gives him the power to order companies to produce things, uh, usually used to produce armaments uh, in wartime. He used it, he actually declared, and I have the quote, to, to, uh, that meat was a scarce and critical material essential to the national defense. Now we got through World War II with very little meat. <laughs> So, so I don't know how critical meat is to the national defense. I have a feeling not at all. But this allowed Trump to order the meat pla plants back to open, make the workers go back. It, it stipulated no protections, no PPEs. Um, and it also took away their ability to sue. It gave them a defense against suits for... Um, so here you have a large company uh, essentially having enough power to enlist the president to do its dirty work and send its workers back onto the line, putting them at grave danger. So is that the situation right now today, that back on the line? Yeah, meat plants, since this uh, order, meat plants have opened. Some of them have, are taking precautions and they have plexiglass screens between people. I haven't heard of any slowing the line speeds. I think that that would be a sign that they're really serious. Um, you have to understand meat packing in America is the most dangerous work, okay? It's more dangerous than firefighting, you know, which traditionally is the dangerous work. But um, as Eric Schlosser pointed out in a recent piece uh, in The Atlantic that I encourage you to read, he said, these, it, so it's because of this high rate of accidents. Um, mm -hmm. People are wielding knives, in, in, you know, very, very quickly in, in, and they're, they're working in like 40 degree temperatures and uh, things are flying by them. Um, but as he pointed out, these are, you can't call these accidents. These are business decisions. Um, you know, it, it doesn't have to be this way. And in many slaughter plants in Europe, it is not this way, but we've essentially deregulated this industry, allowed it to concentrate. And now, you know, look, it gave us cheap meat. I mean, Americans, you know, spend less on their food than any people on the planet. And we have enormous efficiencies in our food system. But what we're learning is that there's a trade-off between efficiency and resilience. Mm -hmm. And if you go back, so we have a single meat plant, for example, that slaughters 5% of all the pork in America. So when that meat plant went down, there were shortages. Uh, not only that, the farmers who had committed their pigs to that plant had nowhere to go. And, you know, pigs keep growing. And very soon they're too big to fit on the line. Uh, and they've got little pigs coming up behind them getting fatter. And so they start euthanizing. Uh, you know, there were farmers describing how to, uh, they were pumping CO2 from their truck exhaust into the sealed houses to kill uh, essentially create gas chambers for their pigs, or they were taking them out and shooting them in huge numbers. So there, there's something very fucked up about this system. Oh. And uh, in a way that I think we didn't see until the pandemic came along. There's a, there's a wonderful line from Warren Buffett. Uh, speaking of an, in another connection, he said, only when the tide goes out do we discover who has been swimming naked. Hmm. Well, there's some very large uh, elements of the American food system that uh, their butts have been exposed. So, so has this uh, had the effect, um, you know, Daisy was talking to start with about how people are wanting to get back to nature. I mean, certainly here, the, the link between COVID and bad diets, obesity, diabetes, is very strong. There's a big push now to want to change. Do you think that that's happening in America? Is this all being exposed? You know, I think the link between the diet and COVID is a story that hasn't really been told very well here yet. Um, the CDC announced that, uh, you know, 48% or 50% of serious cases of COVID were linked to either obesity or um, hypertension, mm -hmm. and another 20 or 30% linked to type 2 diabetes. Guess what? All three, the biggest risk factors for COVID, are the products of the Western diet, of, of mm -hmm. a diet too high in meat, too high in processed foods and sugar, 
refined carbohydrates. And, uh, you know, this diet in, in normal times kills us slowly, but surely. And in crisis times like this, uh, with a pandemic like this, it's killing us quickly. Uh, and so I think that that, uh, that aspect of the, the West, of the industrial food chain needs a lot more attention. Um, that uh, people who have, you know, been eating badly were putting themselves at risk for a risk that they, of course, could not have foreseen. Um, but that is just another problem with the food system. Um, you know, there have been some, some uh, points of light here. Um, so far, local food systems have held up better. Um, farmers who, who sell to restaurants have managed to reroute their food into box schemes mm -hmm. and to farmers markets. Farmers markets are very busy right now. Uh, so they're finding a market for their food. There's going to be a labor crisis, though, I think, this summer. Um, we depend on guest workers from Mexico to harvest our crops here in California. Uh, is Trump going to let them in? Uh, are they going to want to come in? Um, we are, we're starting to see higher rates of COVID among farm workers who live in, they work very close together, but they also live in close quarters, often on trailers on these big farms. So, um, you know, I think it's a reckoning for the food system and is a wake up call uh, that um, we need to sacrifice a certain amount of efficiency to achieve a greater degree of resilience. And that means redundancy. Um, you know, once upon a time when there were, you know, literally thousands of small regional meat plants, the closure of any one of them would not have been a story. No one would have heard about it uh, because the slack would have been very easily picked up. But this is, you know, the, this is the problem when you allow an industry to concentrate to the extent you have and then remove regulations from it. Okay. Now, unfortunately, we are running out of our time already. And I want to quickly, before we finish, just touch on your new audio, your book you've done for Audible, the first book you've done for Audible, which is about caffeine. And you memorably say that, you know, caffeine has, in a way, enabled people to work in places like Tyson's factory. Because yeah. <laughs> it, has, it has enabled, and you have a great line in there somewhere, it's enabled in a way the industrial world to um, alter our concepts of day and night and how long we can work for. Can you give me like literally two or three lines about that? And then we can- Yeah, so look, okay. I love caffeine. I drink coffee. Um, I know. I'm not a scold about caffeine. It's important to understand. On balance, it's very good for your health. Sleep is in another slightly different issue, um, but but caffeine and capitalism have this you know unholy alliance and have for a very long time. Caffeine allowed us to get uh, to move from outdoor labor, which you could be drunk doing, to mm -hmm. indoor labor using heavy machinery where you had to be pretty together and alert. It also allowed us to have second and third shifts, um, get off the cycle of the sun. I mean, people used to stop working when it got dark uh, and not start working till it was light. Caffeine allows us to do all that. It allows us to uh, focus in a way that is very important for the rise of things like double entry bookkeeping and <laughs> accounting of all kinds. Um, and, you know, just think about the coffee break. What an amazing idea that employers on their own offered employees time off and a free beverage. Now, why were they doing that? Because coffee made workers more productive, tea too. And um, so the coffee break, which is a wonderful institution, I wouldn't want to change it, uh, was really discovered by some very clever capitalists in America uh, and has uh, done wonders for increasing productivity. So when you drink that cup of coffee, think about who, who you're working for. Michael, thank you. On that note, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave you in California and I'm going to return to London to Daisy and thank you so much and it's incredible. Thank you, Rosie. You Always a pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye.